It's important to appreciate that the gulf between the needs and aspirations of the practising profession and those of the university, and in particular the university law schools, is not necessarily a bad thing. Jeremy Weber has written about that and he points out that the role of research at a law school is not and should not be confined to acting as a research arm of the courts or of practicing or for practicing lawyers. The responsibilities of academic lawyers are much wider and extend to analyzing the historical, sociological and economic foundations of the legal system as well as exploring the broader philosophical and theoretical questions that rarely have a place in professional or judicial discourse. Even so, I think Michael Coper has a point. Indeed, although he was speaking of the challenges facing law schools, his comments uh, have a wider application. The balance he proposes should, I think, inform the work of practicing lawyers and judges so that they too can identify circumstances uh, where a broader perspective than that provided by orthodox legal principles or by traditional sources is likely to prove useful. A similar balance is also required if those interested in reform are to achieve success in moulding the law and the legal system to more faithfully reflect the values that should characterise a liberal democratic society, values that promote tolerance, equality of opportunity and individual autonomy, as well as the rule of law. This broader responsibility seems to me now, as it always has, to lie at the heart of the role of a university in society. Universities are certainly there to teach skills and to equip students to participate in their chosen professions or occupations. Of course, all occupations <coughs> are now professions. But they're also there to foster and support teaching and research on topics that may appear to have very little immediate practical application. Activities of this kind include research directed to promoting long-term changes in legal institutions, legal principles and legislation. In an age where economic imperatives reign supreme, despite the fragility of many of the assumptions underlying economic analysis, and I do recommend for those of you who haven't read it, Kahneman's recent book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he's a uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, with the uh, uh, research interest in psychology and economics in his book is astonishing. It's also astonishing for lawyers about what it tells you about how people think and how wrong economists are in their analysis. <laughs> but in any event, despite the fragility of these assumptions, um, we are in an age where independent institutions whose members devote themselves to theoretical research or long-term policy issues struggle to receive public funding and recognition. Commentators have frequently remarked that the heyday of law reform commissions in this country uh, has passed as efficiency dividends, a wonderful expression, and the territorial imperatives of bureaucrats have taken their toll. Even the institutions themselves, including the universities, seem less keen to take a long-term view as they increasingly emphasise quantitative rather than qualitative measures of achievement hence the little additions you all do when you uh, tot up the number of refereed articles that you have published. But what of the relationship between academic research and the legal profession, particularly the courts? At one level, the uh, contributions of legal research to the court system and in particular to the work of judges are perfectly obvious. Textbooks and law journal articles, which of course are not exclusively written by academics, play an important if not indispensable role in enabling the courts to do their job. The contributions of text writers, for example, can be seen at all levels of the judiciary through citations in judgments, even though uh, the citations are not always as forthcoming as perhaps they might be. At a basic level, recourse to standard or specialised text enables a judge who is not necessarily completely familiar with the legal principles that govern a particular case to gain an appreciation of those principles at an early stage in the proceedings. That is surprisingly important because as the courts have moved to systems of case management, it becomes much more important for judges to understand what a case is about, what <coughs> issues are at stake and what the governing principles are at a stage before any submissions have been received. In addition, um, no one should underestimate how frequently courts both at the trial and appellate levels, receive meagre assistance from the parties in identifying the uh, true issues. The extent uh, to which 
non-judicial sources are acknowledged in courts can be measured. I have discovered somewhat to my surprise that there is an industry, largely a one-man industry, by a gentleman named R. Smythe. I don't know whether R. Smythe is here, but he's published, or she perhaps, has published lots and lots of statistical reports. It's an unnerving experience to read that based on a sample of federal court cases for the years 1996 to 1998, I delivered myself of 1.17 citations to non-judicial sources per judgment at a rate of 0.083 citations per page. <laughs> However, the winner was Justice Finn. Um, he had 3.18 citations per judgment and 0.230 citations per page. But there again, he was an academic when he was appointed a judge. And moreover, he has an unfair advantage uh, because in relation to citations per page because he's much more concise than I am. <laughs> uh, one difficulty with all of this is that studies become outdated. But one of the studies is of the High Court uh, from the period 1990 to 1997. And during that period, it sh the studies show that the number of citations non-judicial citations per case increased from 0.87 in 1990 to 9 in 1997. I don't know what has happened since. As far as I know, there hasn't been a further study of that kind. Interesting, the largest number of citations in the High Court to law journals during that period weren't to university law reviews. They were to the Australian Law Journal and the Law Quarterly Review. So there you go with referee journals. The vast bulk of litigation does not present either a trial or on appeal any novel or particularly complex questions. Uh, and indeed, a good deal of the High Court's work these days seems to involve fact-finding on issues such as the propensity of Australians to eat chips well before lunch. <laughs> I refer you to Strong and Woolworths Limited uh, at uh, paragraph 37. Much legal scholarship focuses on uh, novel questions of law and on providing uh, means by which and suggestions for which the law to accommodate policy objectives. I won't go into the details of the cases of that kind that have been profoundly influenced by academic work, but you only have to think of Marbo, uh, Cole and Whitfield, where Michael Coper played a part. He was actually the second junior counsel for New South Wales in that case, and that's probably <coughs> why the High Court didn't refer to his seminal work on Section 92. <laughs> Uh, he was briefed in that case because of a well-founded fear that the first junior counsel for New South Wales would uh, be largely useless. And, uh, that <laughs> uh, in the most recent constitutional uh, decision in the High Court, the school's chaplain case, you'll be pleased to know that there were 742 footnotes replete with references to textbooks, journal articles, and I'm finishing, Peter, uh, official reports, opinions, and other non-judicial non Sources. Justice Hayden referred at length to contemporary scholarship in order to support what he describes as the common assumption. That is his view. Um, <laughs> academic research can, of course, influence uh, uh, the development of the law in other ways, and in particular through law reform reports. Uh, an article by Marcia Neve, then the chairperson of the Victorian Law Reform Commission, in the same volume as Michael Coper's work boldly compiled a list of what she characterised as social law reform projects undertaken by law reform bodies in Australia. And if you look at that impressive list, you will see how many of them were influenced by academic legal research. So, from the judicial perspective, there is both creative tension and collaboration between legal research, particularly that conducted in the academy, and the work of the wider legal profession including the courts. This, I think, along with Jeremy Weber, is by no means a bad thing. While one measure of the worth of legal research is the impact it has on judicial decision making or on law reform, this is not the only or even the primary criterion to apply. The work of legal scholars can, of course, have a profound influ influence on the attitudes and actions of future generations of lawyers without that work ever being cited in a judgment or report although it probably does help if someone reads the book or article. Like the divinity, legal research can work in mysterious ways. Thank you.